Hey Mouth 43, let's look at the empirical rule, or sometimes it is referred to as the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule. So here we go, it's a big rule in stats. So it says if the histogram of values in a data set can be reasonably well approximated by a normal curve, then, and then we get a whole bunch of stuff. So let's break down what the dot, dot, dot is. Now when it says a histogram of values, imagine you have a histogram here, so a bunch of rectangles, and if we were going to draw its little distribution over it, it would look like a unimodal bell curve, right? And we'll say that it's approximately normal. All right? And that'll be one of our favorite phrases that we use from here on in. But if you have data that is approximately normal, then with the empirical rule, we can approximate a bunch of stuff with it. So it'll say approximately 68% of the observations are within one standard deviation of the mean. So let's just get some notation down here before we apply it on the graph. So when we're talking theory, right, when we're talking on the bell curve, we're going to talk about parameters. So when we talk about population mean, we mean mu. Okay. If I was talking about the sample mean, I'd put an X bar. For standard deviation, right, if we're talking in theory, right, not a statistic but a parameter, we will use lowercase sigma. If you remember, capital sigma was that E looking letter. That meant to add things. This is lowercase sigma and it stands for population standard deviation. So let's think about what this is saying. It's saying 68% of the data or 68% of your observations are within one standard deviation of the mean. That means it's either one above or one below the mean. So if you look at your bell curve, right, and we know that the mean falls right below that peak, what it's saying is from this standard, from this mean, excuse me, I could go up a deviation or down a deviation, and if I tried to kind of shade this in, right, if I was going to get that area under the curve and kind of shade it in here, and I'm only going to shade it lightly because we've got a few of these to do. If I was going to shade that, that area under the curve in, that's about 68% of my data. All right, so that's what the empirical rule is saying. If you can't see that, let me darken it just a bit. I don't want to write too dark just because I'm going to erase it in a bit. So that is about 68% of the data. So we're saying that 68% of observations go within a standard deviation of the mean. Right? So most folks or most observations fall within a standard deviation of the mean. 68% of them do. All right, now if you were to go two standard deviations out in either direction, so if you start from the mean and you go one, two up and one, two back, or you can say two above and two below, so let me, again, erase this. So we're going to erase this a few times. But if I were to go two up and two below from the mean, all right, approximately 95% of my observations are within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I go two up and two back, if this was where I was headed, and I tried to shade this area under the curve, right? You can see that's a pretty good chunk of the area under the curve, right? Because the total area under the curve is 1, and I've shaded about 95%. That's what the empirical rule is telling us. That if you go two standard deviations up and back from the mean, that 95% of your data falls there. Right? And it looks like 95%. Uh, that's a significant chunk of my overall curve of 100%, or the, I should say the overall area under that curve. And this is what the empirical rule tells us, that 95% of observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So 68% go within a standard deviation, and then 95% go within two. And here's where the 99.7 comes in. Approximately 99.7% of the observations are within three standard deviations of the mean. So if I was to erase this 95%, and then change my bounds on my x-axis to go three up and three back, or three above the mean, three below the mean, you're practically way out here. I mean, you can see we're, there's almost no area left, right? I'm shading almost every single part of the area under that curve, and what the empirical rule is saying is that 99.7% of observations fall within three standard deviations of the mean. And when we take a look at this, I also just want to talk about how many standard deviations are down here. 
So you imagine if I went one, two, three above the mean and one, two, three below the mean, there are actually six standard deviations on this x-axis, right? Because here's a standard deviation, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and here's one, right? That's one, two, three, four, five, six standard deviations, all right? So for, for just a, a pretty good approximation, any bell curve has about six standard deviations in total on the x-axis. Theoretically, it goes forever, all right? So all the calculus folks figure out theoretically it goes forever, but in the real world, we know that 99.7% are within three standard deviations. And if you're talking three above, three below, that spans, that range is six standard deviations. All right, so just, it's a good rule of thumb. There's usually six standard deviations on the x-axis, give or take. All right, before we leave this graph behind, I wanna relate this to z-scores. So let's see if we can figure out what z-scores are on all of these tick marks down here. All right, so I'm gonna ask you, and then I'm gonna wait a moment because I, I want you to try and think before I say it, right? Think of the answer before I say it. So what standard, not what standard deviation, excuse me. Let, let's go to this, this symbol, mean plus two standard deviations. What would the z-score be here? So if I was at the mean and then I jumped up one, up two standard deviations, my z-score here would be two. All right, so where this is the x-axis, let's relabel this with z's. That's literally what a z-score of two means, that you are two standard deviations above the mean. What would the z-score be here where you were mu minus sigma, meaning you started at the mean and you went down a standard deviation? Well, your z-score there would be negative one. All right, what is your z-score if you're actually at the mean? It's zero. And then you can see our z-axis fills in like it always does, right? Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. So every data set can be re-standardized, or I should not say re-standardized, can be standardized onto the standard normal distribution. So that's what all those z-scores do. It takes any x values and converts them to a common scale called z-scores. All right, so this is all fine and good, but when we're dealing with the empirical rule, it deals with middles. So I'm gonna put here, this is the middle 68%. This is the middle 95% and the middle 99.7. So let me kind of just talk about what I mean when I say, it. let's go with middle 68. So let me erase my shading and put this one back for reals. So let's go one above, one below, just to do the 68. And we can play it out with any of these three numbers, but I'll just start with the 68. So when I say the middle, sixty-eight percent. It's because I started quite literally from the middle of the bell curve or the middle of the x-axis, and then I went out a standard deviation on either side. So I looked at the middle 68%. And why I mention this is because the empirical rule is awesome. It deals with the middle 68, the middle 95, the middle 99.7. But your calculator, the way your calculator is built, is it's built in percentiles, which is from a certain number on down. And when I say on down, we shade from a certain x value all the way to the left. Right, so from a certain x value all the way to the left, from a certain x value all the way to the left. So while this is the middle 68%, which is awesome, it's got different percentiles on either side and we have to be able to convert middles, so middle 68% over to percentiles to get our calculator to work. So let's start to look at how you can use the empirical rule to kind of figure out what percentiles are here. And I'll tell you, this is the 16th and 84th percentile. All right, you might be like, how on earth did she get that? Well, let me explain. All right, so let's take a different view of this, this bell curve. All right, so let me get that into view. And here, I'll just scooch that down a little so we can see the top. All right, so another graphical view of this rule looks at percentages on each side of the mean. So go with me. If we were going one above, one below, right? Within one standard deviation of the mean and we got the middle 68%. I think you could see through symmetry, it's 34% on a side. And if you're not quite sure where I'm getting 34%, let me get my calculator. All right, 
If we had 68% total and we divided it by two, that would be 34% on a side, okay? So here's the middle 68, all right? But now I wanna talk about how on earth did I get 13.5 on a side? Why did we add 13.5% here, 13.5 here? All right, we talked that if you went one deviation out, that was 68%. And the rule was if you went two deviations out, that was 95%. So let's talk about two deviations. So if I go two standard deviations, that's 95%, right? If I had only gone the one standard deviation, that was 68%. So how am I getting 13 and a half? Okay, so look at the difference. You went from 68 to 95. Let's think about what we gained. So if I had 95 but started with 68, I gained 27%, right? But there's symmetry, because I gained some on this side and some on this side. And you gained it equally. So if I divide by two, that's gonna get me 13 and a half percent. So between the first and second deviation on the right side of your curve, there's 13 and a half percent of the overall curve. So 13% of the area under the curve, excuse me, 13.5% of the area under the curve lies between the first and second deviation. It also lies between the first and second deviation on the left side. So 13.5% on either side. All right, now let's talk about how did I get the 2.35%. All right, so we went from one deviation to two deviations. Now we're up to three deviations. Now if you go three standard deviations, you were at 99.7%. So let's think about how much we gained here. If I think about 99.7, but I had 95 before I crunched this, I gained 4.7%. So I jumped 4.7% from here to here. But keep in mind, there's symmetry, right? There's some on this side, some on this side, and they need to be equal. So if I just cut that in half, I'm looking at 2.35. So between the second and third deviations, whether you're above the mean or below the mean, you pick up 2.35%. And then let's talk about where are we getting the 0.15%. All right, you know this entire circle has to be 100%, right? So not entire circle, excuse me, entire bell curve. There's no circles here. Entire bell curve is 100%. Probability of your sample space has got to equal 1. How much did I gain? Well, if I take 100 and I subtract out 99.7, and through symmetry I divide it by 2, you're seeing I'm gaining 0.15% on either side. And another way of saying that is it's super difficult on a bell curve to be more than three standard deviations above or below the mean. It only happens 0.15% of the time. All right, so that's a very, very small decimal. That's 0.0015. All right, so here's how the empirical rule breaks down with symmetry. But what I also want to do is think about all of these numbers as percentiles. So with that, usually the one where that's easiest to kind of get in our head is the mean. So I will start us here. This is the 50th percentile. Okay. Most folks are like, yeah, if it's symmetry, uh, if everything's nice and symmetrical, the mean and the median are the same, so the mean's got to be the 50th percentile. But I want us to look at a different way of getting to 50%. So I want you to imagine you started from the mean and you looked only to the left in this on down um, fashion. So I want us to add up how much area under the curve is from this, this x value on down, this mean value. So if I take, oops, excuse me. All right, so let's take 34, add 13.5, add 2.35, and then add 0.15. Oops, excuse me. What do you get? 50. And I mention this because when we start to look at percentiles, it won't be middle 68, middle 95, middle 99, 7. It's going to be from a certain x value on down. Right? It is going to be a cumulative relative frequency. So with that being said, I want us to think about what percentile are we rocking if we are at a z-score of 1 or if we are at one standard deviation above the mean. And how you find that percentile is you add all of this area under the curve. So let me bring my calculator back in and let's add all of those areas, right? So I would do 34 plus 34 plus 13.5 plus 2.35 and then plus 0.15.
and what percentile do I have? The 84th percentile. So 84% of the area under my curve is from the z-score of 1 on down. Okay, so let me write this. This is the 84th percentile. Let me put this in a box just so it doesn't get in our way. Now, I, I wouldn't have added all of these numbers up. I would have just said, well, I know the 50th percentile is here, and I'm going to gain 34 more. 34 percent more, so I would have done 50 plus 34 and gotten to my 84. All right. So one deviation above the mean. If you score a deviation over the mean and you're on an approximately normal distribution, you're in the 84th percentile. All right, let's see what happens when you're one deviation below the mean. All right. And I think you would give me, if you go below the mean, right, your, your percentile better be less than 50 percent because you're under uh, the average. So there's a couple ways of doing this. I can put my ruler here to kind of guide us. All right, and then we can just calculate the area to the left of this, this ruler. So I'm gonna do it here, all right, and bring my calculator back in. So if I did this, right, I would be looking at adding 13.5 plus 2.35 plus 0.15, and I would be looking at 16%. So that is the 16th percentile. It's literally saying from here on down, and I say on down because these are our lower x values, right? Our x values get larger as we go left to right, and I'm moving right to left, so these x values are getting smaller. So from here on down, there is 16% of the curve, 16% of the area under that curve. So this is the 16th percentile. And I had said up top that the middle 68 is cut off by the 84th percentile and the 16th percentile, and that's what I was talking about. And if you take 84 and subtract 16, sure enough, you do have 68% in between those two values. All right, let's get some more percentiles, though. Let's keep this happening. So now I want to figure out what percentile has a z-score of 2. And I'm going to scooch my arrow in there, so I want to go right here. Now keep in mind, this was the 50th, right? Then we lost 34% to get to 16. Oh, I don't think I pointed that out. Again, I, I wouldn't have added these three numbers. I would have just taken the 50th percentile and subtracted 34. So if I do 50 minus 34, you get to 16. All right, so now let's figure out what's the area to the left of my ruler at this point. And you have a couple of ways, right? You could add 2.35 and 0.15 or you could take 16 and subtract 13.5. So let's do it both ways just so we can see it. Right? So I could do 2.35 plus 0.15 and figure out, oh, that's the 2.5th percentile. Or really what I would do is I would say, well, I'm going to start at 16, but I'm going to lose 13.5%, so I'm getting to 2.5. So this is the 2.5th percentile. So if you are two standard deviations below the mean, you're in the 2.5th percentile. One below the mean, 16th percentile. At the mean, 50th percentile. One above the mean, 84th percentile. But let's even this out. What was the percentile here? If you had a z-score of two, all right, so if you were two standard deviations above the mean, now again, you could add a bunch of numbers together, right? I could put my ruler here and add this, 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 this. That's a lot to add, though. I don't really want to do that. I'd like to be efficient. I knew this was the 84th percentile, so let me just add 13.5% to it because that's the extra area I picked up under the curve. So 84 plus 13.5 gets me 97.5. Right, and you can keep on going if you want. You could add another 2.35 to that number, and you could find out this was, good lord, this is the 99th, 99.85th percentile, right? And then I could even go the other way, right? I can take 2.5 and subtract 2.35. You're going to find out this is the 0.15th percentile. And these are just major markers in terms of percentiles, and I say major markers because they fall on integer values of z-scores, all right? So 
a z square of 1, 84, a z square of 0, 50, negative 1, 16, right? Negative 2, 2.5, negative 3, 0.15. But I don't want you to think you couldn't find the 60th percentile. Like if I wanted the 60th percentile, it would be somewhere around here, right? It'd be between the 50th and 84th, so maybe here. So just eyeballing it, maybe that z square would be about, I don't know, one third, all right? Or a little bit less than one half. And we're gonna come up with a way to find that, but I just want you to hear that I don't want you to think there are only these percentiles. Every number has a percentile. It's just not every percentile has a nice integer value for a z-score. All right, so I just put little notes here and we can read through them, right? So it says, you can see on each side of the mean, one standard deviation away from the mean, the area under the curve, oh, excuse me, you can see 34% on each side of the mean, one standard deviation away from the mean, the area under the curve totals 68%. If you travel two standard deviations away from the mean, the total area under the curve is 95. Three standard deviations in either direction, right, totals 99.7% of the area under that curve. You can also see the equivalent z scores across the bottom of that curve. So I gave you the x scores if you want to have just your x value, but again, any variable can be converted to the standard normal distribution with z scores. All right, so with that, we're going to work with this idea on the next page, we're going to use the empirical rule to get a bunch of probabilities. All right, see you in a bit.